when you hear the term populist, there's a sort of insidious suggestion that when voters defy the governing classes, that somehow this is kind of driven by a racist and xenophobic, vulgar or ill-informed or ill-educated ideas. And lots of people now talk about populism as though it's a very scary concept. And I think that what we wanted to explore in this discussion was whether that has some merit or not. I'm not really surprised that we're using the word populist in such a promiscuous way to describe everything that the cultural elites in Europe don't like. And I think the reason for that is very simple, is that people who tend to be influential in the media, in the dominant institution of society, are often the ones that define the language that we speak. And people that haven't got a voice or haven't got access to uh, newspaper editorials are often are the ones that are described. I think there's a silent cultural war against populism. I think that uh, anything that in some shape or form has anything good to say about the past is by today's cultural elites dismissed as being weird and horrible. In the EU, you, know, you have a situation where the European Union actually prides itself in what I call a year zero history, where European history begins in 1945, and anything before that is just you know, Auschwitz. Given the fact that some of these movements use you know, historical symbols, speak the language of, of their historical culture, they are seen as being an, a negative and represent something very bad. I think in Europe, you're allowed to have any identity you want, except for one identity, which is pathologized, and that's national identity. There's this kind of simplistic notion that if you have a national feeling, a national consciousness, you know, fairly soon you're on the road to Kristallnacht. It's all about forgetting that actually there is no historical link between national feeling and Nazism. And that's, that kind of causality that's being established is a, is a question of reading history backward. And we're now getting to the point where in the old days there used to be a, a, a clear distinction between civil nationalism, ethnic nationalism, nationalism, and, and patriotism. There was all these different gradations. And educated people understood that there were certain form of national consciousness that on balance were all right. And finally, the anti-populist impulse is hostile to sovereignty, where you know, the nation's right to determine its own future is decried because uh, anti-populist anti sentiments are cosmopolitan by nature. They prefer international institutions. In other words, they prefer non-democratic institutions that are not accountable to people over national ones because the thing about national sovereignty, whatever you think of it, is that for better or worse, people in a national parliament become accountable to the people that elected them. And I think this is something I feel very strongly about. They hate popular sovereignty. They really think that popular sovereignty, by which, you know, which, which is traditionally seen as underpinning democracy, in other words, it, un it basically means that the people make decisions that affect their future, is, is not really a, a, an effective, and it's not really a, an enlightened way of making decisions. The way I see it, much of populism is a legitimate backlash against the domination of what one might call the double liberalism, the, the economic liberalism that we associate with the 1980s, the social, social and cultural liberalism that emerged in the 60s and the 70s. Some of it is clearly illegitimate, perhaps 7% of our population who are genuinely authoritarian and xenophobic. That The people from anywhere tend to be um, highly educated and mobile, and that's particularly true of this country because of residential universities. They tend to be able to surf social change comfortably. They tend not to have very strong group attachments because they have been so mobile. And on the other hand, you have the, the people from somewhere who I estimate is, I reckon, about half the population tend to be less well-educated, more rooted, tend to value security and familiarity, tend to have much stronger group attachments than anywheres what I would call decent populism, the kind of mainstream somewhere priorities and, and intuitions, are what really quite recently would have been called centrism, a desire to have your, for your country to have relatively secure borders, you know, moderate levels of immigration rather than mass immigration, one might say, putting the rights of national citizens before universal rights or the rights of non-citizens, um, something that is made illegal by the European Union's uh, non-discrimination rules. All of those things, you know, not very long ago, would have been seen as completely mainstream. So I would say that populism, it is the centrism of not very long ago. And it is a reaction against a, a set of political priorities 
that in some ways set their face against those rather simple things. I mean, the thing of when things are taken out of the democratic conflict and they move into the technocratic state, you can bet your bottom dollar that those things will be decided according to the interests and priorities and intuitions of the anywheres and not the somewheres. And I think that is what has happened. It has given elites often a sense of greater control and it's given non-elites a sense of loss and a sense of loss of sovereignty. In, uh, in Turkey, in, in the Black Sea region, there's a little town called Sinop. And this is the place where ancient Greek philosopher Diogenes lived. And we have a statue there. And Diogenes, as you know, is regarded as the father of the cosmopolitan thought, the cosmopolitan ideal. And every year we have mobs of Turkish nationalists going to this statue to take it down and asking why do we have the statue of a Greek philosopher in the middle of a Turkish town. And I think this little example says us, tells us so much about this conflict, this ongoing conflict between tribalism, nationalism, and the other cosmopolitan ideal. We have seen how nationalism divides people. We've seen how nationalism does create more and more bloodshed. So when nationalism used in a more positive sense, there's a part of me that sincerely doubts it because we've seen the practice of nationalism on the ground throughout history with Brexit, with Trump's election, with, yes, I will use that word, populist movements from the Philippines all the way to Austria, one after another. We have seen the very similar patterns Populism has experienced a surge in crisis-ridden countries like Greece, but also in relatively quite wealthy countries like Sweden. And I think they are connected, there are similarities, and we need to pay more attention. One of the things that populist discourse, because it is a discourse that does, is to create its own myths, is to create its own dualities. Populist demagogues need an other all the time. And one of the biggest dualities that we are being fed constantly is this duality between the real people and the elite. I want to question that. What exactly is the elite? No one can convince me that easily that Marine Le Pen herself is not part of the elite, or Heath Wilders is not part of the elite, or Trump himself is not part of the financial elite. But their success is in presenting themselves as if they were not part of this establishment, as if they have been zoomed from another planet and therefore they're completely clean. There is no such thing. And secondly, in my opinion, let's be very cautious about this over-romanticization of the Volk, of the real people. This is a dangerous road that does, yes, go all the way back to nationalism and tribalism. This idea that the real people are so pure and innocent and whatever they decide in the ballot box is the right decision can go in very di dangerous directions. And I think ours is the age of anxiety of fear, of fear of the other, fear of the future. And it would be a tremendous mistake to belittle these emotions. And unfortunately, we live in an age in which populist demagogues do exploit these fears. So the ballot box in itself is not enough to sustain a democracy. It's almost as if we live in a parallel universe, because one of the most interesting things for me is that nationalism in Europe is conspicuously weak. If you have a sense of history, the flag waving that we, we were known in the 19th century and the interwar period, there's nothing like it. I, you know, there are this small number of you know, fascist types, right wing movements, but they are very, very small and very, very in insignificant. And I think there's a, a fantasy that's being developed. Every time there's something uncomfortable, we kind of revisit the 30s and imagine that it's happening now. And I think that kind of politics means that the real, you know, the, the people that are really practicing the politics of fear is not just Trump, and he does that really well, but the people who are promoting fear about populism. What they really are saying, I'm against the politics of fear of Trump, but my politics of fear about the majoritarian threat or about the ballot box on its own, that's cool, that's really all right, because that's, that's a liberal politics of fear somehow. My 
point is, let's not be that confident about nationalism not being an issue in the European continent. There was a very interesting Pew Research survey published in 2016 all across European countries. And the question people were asking in very different forms was about diversity. And the percentage of people who said, you know, I'm not fond of diversity, I'm not fond of cosmopolitanism, I want a more monolithic culture. People who said that, the percentage of uh, people who answered in that way in eight European countries was alarmingly high. You're putting into the same box lots of different movements and tendencies and indeed lots of different kind of political emotions. I mean, obviously the Islamists, the white supremacists are beyond the pale. But I think most of the inspiration behind popular, so-called populist movements is, is decent populist. But, uh, by which I mean, I should have sort of spelt this out earlier, they are people who broadly accepted the great liberalisation the last 40 years or so on race, on gender, on sexuality but they are not liberals. They still also uh, are, are strongly attached to nation states. They're often strongly attached to their own group, as it were. That is legitimate. That, that doesn't turn you into some kind of fascist. What would you say to the criticism that the cosmopolitan stance is actually an anti-diversity stance? Because what the, the cosmopolitan does is they go to different countries and they don't want to meet anybody who is representative or who is typical of the populations in those countries. They want to meet other liberals. And when they want people from those countries to come into Britain, what they mean is they want people who are either liberal or who can easily assimilate into a liberal culture. Um, so actually, cosmopolitanism is a plea for less diversity rather than more diversity. David, you described a number of views as legitimate and others as illegitimate. So when you were talking about the Anywheres, you said they had legitimate views, and I agree with you. Um, then when you talked about the Somewheres, you said that there's this core of authoritarians, the 6 to 7%, who have illegitimate views. I, I would question whether any view is illegitimate. We have to recognise that anyone, even an authoritarian, or someone with very backward views, has the ability to understand, to listen, to reason, and to change their point of view. The anywheres, it seems to me, are always trying to curtail debate by saying that so many views are beyond the pale. I mean, clearly, people who are advocating going around killing homosexuals or, or Jews, there are certain views that are illegitimate. There is a distinction between a sin and a crime. I think that's, an, that's an, another way of looking at it. Views that you, that you disapprove of and that if they became mainstream, would, be, would, would produce a society you wouldn't want to live in, but they are not necessarily uh, inadmissible, as it were. That they should be, as you say, uh, you know, defeated in argument. The majority is overwhelmingly decent, I would say, on, on most of these issues. The, the paradox of cosmopolitanism is, of course, the fact that cosmopolitans require the existence of strong, continuing national cultures. Cosmopolitanism is about flitting from culture to national culture to national culture to national culture and enjoying the differences uh, of, of the world. But that requires there to be differences. That requires there to be national cultures you can flit between. Uh, of course, voting for Brexit doesn't make one a xenophobe, but I think we need to pay more attention to emotions and to people who exploit, especially populist demagogues who exploit those fears. The Football Lads Alliance had a march in London against Islamic extremism and general extremism. Mm -hmm. And every single media publication reported it as a far-right march. Um, I supported them on Twitter because they were going to people like The Guardian, the usual suspects, saying, we are not far-right as an organisation. We are the Football Lads Alliance. We are 30,000 men with very indifferent political leanings. And every time we try and say something, working class white men in this country, we get called far right. I'm very nervous about the discussion about emotions, just because I think all of us will remember after the Brexit vote happened, it was very much talked about in terms of an emotional response. It was an emotional vote. It was a howl from the deep. It was this very irrational, visceral thing that was kind of apolitical. That's how people who were anti-Brexit talked about it. And I think that actually the important thing that you might be missing is that um, populist movements are not necessarily emotional. It's not that we need to get in touch with people's emotions. It's that we need to take people seriously politically. I think that the key battle you know, in the future is really about democracy, having confidence in the people, 
is really an essential element of public life. You know, people talk about civic society, but civic society these days be, being you know, part of the state, I mean, being funded by the state. I think the public sphere, which, where, where, where individuals make decisions about their future and encouraging that culture is what's really, really important. <laughs>